guys, how's it going? Today I want to give you a tour of our cut flower garden to show you where everything is at, how the flowers are looking, uh, talk about the thrip uh, problem that we were dealing with. It's beautiful right now. It's about 7.15 in the morning. The sun hasn't peaked over the trees and it actually has a cool, there's a cool edge to the air, which is very welcome. We're at the beginning of a cool down. Yesterday was 105. I think today is like 98 or something. And then by the end of the 10 day, we're in the low 80s. We're going to start right here, even though the cut flower garden is there, just because I wanted to walk down this grass pathway because there are some beautiful things. I'm just loving how these beds are filling in. And it's interesting because, you know, we're taking a very willy nilly, no plan approach to this garden out here. Uh, you know, I thought that I was going to want to move more things around and there are a few things like, for example, this uh, geranium right here is not digging the full sun. In fact, the ones that are more shrouded look better. The ones toward the edge just have kind of fizzled out. So I'm going to dig up what's there and move them. Everything else though, like the cat's meow nepeta, the ginger wine nine bark, those Arctic fire dogwoods, you guys, do you remember when I planted them last year? They were little and they have really grown. And I love that green backdrop with the Firefly Peach Sky Yarrow and the Niagara Falls Panicum. And then we've got the Back in Black Sedum bringing that really beautiful kind of red note to this bed. Uh, the Rise Up Amberness, right? No, uh, something, I don't know. Maybe we'll put the name on the screen. But those are gorgeous. The blue spruce is growing. I'm just really thrilled. I have done zero planting on this side this year, but uh, this is a drops of Jupiter oregano. This needs to be shorn back and moved. I'm gonna move that this fall. Look at what it does. <laughs> it got way bigger than I thought it was going to. Way bigger than our other drops of Jupiter oregano, which are on the west side and they stay much smaller because they don't get as much sun. So when I popped this one out here, I thought, well, this is gonna be nice. This will be a nice little border plant. It's like a shrub. Sometimes you just don't know how something's gonna act. So that one, too unruly for that spot. But the coral jade sedum is gorgeous. Oh, we're starting to get a little bit of sun now. Already, dang, I thought I was gonna beat it. Okay, let's scoot a little quicker. The grass pathways are really filling in out here and the benches have just made it. They kind of ground the space. I don't know if you can kind of feel that from here, but they add some weight and I thought I was going to miss the vertical interest of the obelisks out there but I don't. I feel like the benches are what was needed out there. I just love it. Okay we got to address the uh, sweet potato vine monster we've got going on here. This is one of the upside <laughs> sweet potato vines. It's like upside lime or something. I planted one and it was such a puny little thing when I put it in here and of course you know one could one could be more of a better manager of the plant and <laughs> could trim it back and such. And I clearly haven't done that, but we do have an imperial blue superbina popping through on this side and some sparkling amethyst. So a little bit of color, but uh, I'm going to be a little bit more selective where I put those sweet potato vines. I mean, it's a nice color and it looks healthy, but it is a, it's a beast. This side, we have a little bit more color. This is pretty. Look at that. That's the saffron finch super tunia right there. Super Tunia sh Raspberry Rush. Oh. And this is our annual quadrant of uh, flowers right here. So we've got it kind of broken up into sections or I'm, I'm going that direction. It's not 100% yet, but we've got the annual quadrant where everything will change every single season. Uh, we've got the rose garden now right here. We've got the perennial section, which is largely annuals this year because I just decided to make that the perennial section. So I do have a few that I've put in there that are amazing and we'll look at those here in a second. But I also have like zinnias and sweet peas and stuff in that area as well, but we'll move more toward perennial in that spot and then we have the quadrant right up front here that's dahlias and zinnias i kind of wanted to do dahlia zinnias in that space forever i don't know but i'm thinking let's just start at this outer row and we'll work our way toward the center now in this space this first row and then half of the second one we had ranunculus and anemones when those were done which we wait till their leaves you know, kind of uh, yellow and die back. Once those were done, we dug them and we're storing the, the corms in the barn, but I went ahead and seeded uh, some California giant zinnias in this space. And oh my goodness, they're about ready to burst. I actually can hear the water's running right now. Can you hear that? 
This week we just started noticing a few of the flowers open. If I walk along here, kind of do it slowly. I just love the California Giants get nice and tall, like 36 inches, and they're just a wild mix of bright color. And you can see like all the buds, they're just budded up everywhere. And it's gonna be awesome. And they are staying so tame so far. And I don't pinch anything, you guys. I, I just don't, I don't know. I, I'm trying to think if I, I have pinched snapdragons before. I didn't really notice like much of a huge difference. I didn't pinch mine this year. Um, I don't pinch my dahlias, don't pinch my zinnias. I just let things kind of do their, their own thing. And I know that there is a reason why people pinch them, you know, more, more productivity or longer stems, that sort of thing. Uh, we don't grow our flowers to sell them, we grow them. Well, usually we grow them so that we can use them inside, enjoy watching them grow, but then also give them away. This year's a little bit different because we've had the thrip problem out here. I haven't wanted to send buggy flowers <laughs> out of this garden. So um, we've just been really enjoying looking at the flowers. I really, I've loved this year. It's been, it's been fun and a good, uh, a good experiment in predatory insects and so on. But, and I am noticing the thrip population decreasing even more. It's like every day, those predatory mites that we release, maybe we can uh, link that video down below if you want to learn more. Uh, but I have noticed the population of thrips just decreasing slightly every single day and that's all I can ask for. I'm loving it. The pollinators are just crazy in this garden this year and it's a good thing. Okay, while we're down here, let's just kind of bump over to this next row because the Rudbeckia this year is insane and it's gorgeous. Let me enter from this side. Last year, my Rudbeckia was a complete bust. I think I ended up with like two plants out of all the ones I started from seed. I have no idea why. I didn't do anything differently last year versus this year, but this year they just took hold and they're doing great. Okay, so zinnias on this side as well. Oh, I've got the limon. This is that talinum limon. I only had four plants out of the ones I started take, and I, I can't remember if I did a whole tray of 24 or if I just did 12, uh, but look at these stems. I don't know, let's see if we can put them up. You can see the detail there. They're beautiful little um, wispy fillers in a bouquet and they have super long stems and the leaves look so healthy. So I just tucked those in when I had a little space, but oh my word, look at these Rebecca. So this first section is the Glorioso Double. Some of them are double, some of them are not, which is kind of typical, but I love it. I think they're just the neatest blend of structure and I love seeing those you know, dark colored cones there. This next section minus that plant right there is orange fudge. But you can see the kind of color we've got there. Kind of that, uh, I don't know, it's a smoky orange on the outside and then the yellow with the burgundy in the middle. It's so pretty. And then we have prairie sun right here, which I love this one, always have. I love how bright and clear the yellow is. And I like the lighter colored center here. And then because it's like yellow here and then it turns like that greenish, it just pops. I think they're so, so pretty. We've got the uh, lone snapdragon here. No thrips, I don't see any in this one. The thrips were the worst in the snapdragons. I think it's just because these flowers are naturally closed. So they're like a nice little house for them. Oh, there's a little black bug, but that's not a thrip. Oh, and then we've got the Sahara variety, which has always been a favorite because it produces so many variations of pinks and yellows and in, like the autumnal colors. Also a lot of different uh, bloom structures. So you get the doubles here. You also get some singles like that right there. You get some kind of that more smoky. Look at these, they're so beautiful. Oh my goodness. Oh, and I love just seeing the massive blooms because we're not just, we're not cutting very many of them. It's so gorgeous. I'm enjoying it so, so much. Okay, what is the next section here? Where's my tag? That is cherry brandy, which is not fully cherry brandy. There's some yellow ones mixed in there, which might be tucked in with the Sahara. But this right here, that's the cherry brandy. Oh, I love it. I love that burgundy and then that smoky mauve kind of color on the outer part of the petals. And then we've got one, which some of you guys were saying it's pink lemonade. I've never seen, I didn't start this one from seed. It was mixed in with um, something else. And it's just one single plant. And I Google searched for pink lemonade and maybe I didn't look hard enough, but I couldn't really find anything that looked quite like this. 
And I don't know if I would have success trying to save seeds because it's around so many others. So I'm not sure even if I gathered the seeds, I'd get this variety again, but I love it. It looks, it glows. So, so pretty. Okay, third row in, we've got our status, which we've got the purple variety right here. Oh, the thing I love about status is that it doesn't matter if you cut it or leave it on the plant, it's gonna dry the same color. Um, and that's amazing. So I don't feel like in a huge rush to get out here and do anything. Unlike the straw flowers, which I'll show you some different stages of bloom for those. I haven't harvested any and I'm feeling the need to come out here and do that. Um, I think this is the blue right here. So we've got purple, which really is more of a purple color. And then blue has more of a blue vibe to it. Still kind of purple, but you can see the difference. We've got yellow right here. So vibrant. And then we have apricot here, which has got a gorgeous bright yellow center. It makes them shine. They do, this one does look more fresh when it's um, a newer bloom, as opposed to some of these other varieties. And then it kind of fades out a little bit. So that's something to consider with that one. Like you probably do want to get out and uh, harvest that one a little bit sooner. And then we have a white status, which they call forever silver, um, but it's white. Really pretty, it looks pretty with the Rudbeckia, doesn't it? Okay, so the rest of this row was stock. We had, well, you can see the tags, marine. We had cat's lavender. Um, there's a couple small tags. What was that? Vintage brown, which is a gorgeous color, and then another one, and then quartet rainbow, which has been one of the only stocks that can hold up to our 100 plus degree heat and keep blooming all through the summer. There are a lot of spent stocks we could come in and remove, but it just keeps producing these new fresh ones. Nice long stems, wonderful scent. They hold really long in a vase. A great variety. Okay, this row right here, the front part of it actually has perennial, uh, they're oriental lilies. I didn't need to dig and move somewhere else. I don't find myself cutting those because they're huge. I mean, they're huge blooms. They're highly scented, which I, I like the scent in small doses, but I don't like a ton of it. So I just find myself, I enjoy looking at the blooms, but I think we could move those to a flower bed and utilize that space differently. And then the back half of this row, this is White Star's Feverfew. And maybe I read the stats wrong or didn't pay attention to the stats. This is not an ideal cut flower. Look how tiny it is. And maybe it's just, it doesn't like it or Maybe, uh, I don't know, who knows? I have used it a couple of times. The flowers are really sweet, but I have to use it in smaller bouquets because it just, you know, I don't know. I don't even know how long those are, eight inches, eight inch stems. I grew three, maybe-ish, three-ish varieties of uh, Feverfew uh, last year or the year, no, it was last year. And they were long stems and wonderful. So I'm gonna have to refer back to the varieties I did the first time and maybe go back to that because while these are sweet, little flowers are just too short. And you guys, most of these beds, like uh, beyond the oriental lilies, we had some mignonette and some corn cockle that we've pulled. So we're just kind of getting ready for our next push of uh, late season stuff. I might even do some fall crops out here. Right here, we had campanulas, the champion pink, champion blue, um, champion lavender, champion white. And they did okay. Those campanulas, the ones that produce the tall stems with the big, you know, uh, bell-shaped blooms, they are, you have to grow them very specifically. When you start them out, they have to be started at a specific temperature, and then at seedling stage, they have to move, be moved to a different temperature. And if it gets too warm, then they'll produce short stalks. And it was very, and I knew going in, I knew all of that. And I just thought, well, let's just see what happens. I'm gonna start them from seed and treat them like everything else. And the pink variety did perform fairly well. It produced long stems. I used it in a few arrangements before I noticed the thrip infestation, but all of the rest of the varieties stayed really short and it really wasn't worth growing them. So for that one, I would definitely recommend following the growing instructions on the uh, seed packet. I got those from Johnny's and it had very detailed instructions on what to do. So it's something I might try at some point, but I don't really, when I'm starting so much because most of this, well, all of this, right here in this section. All of it started from seed, whether, you know, direct seed in the ground or started in the greenhouse. And it's a lot to manage. So I don't really want to have to fuss with certain crops. And then we have the bronze Nicotiana right here. Beautiful blooms, beautiful color. I'm kind of letting it do its thing, get wild, kind of drop seed over here, and then we'll have it forever. <laughs> It'll be lovely. Uh, the thing I've noticed this year, and I'm not sure, I don't, those predatory mites do not eat aphids, but usually my Nicotiana is covered in aphids and I almost grow it as a host crop so that the aphids don't bother anything else. 
Um, and yeah, they, it's just clean. There's no aphids. So, and we're not spraying at all. We've not sprayed a single time out here. I don't know what the deal is. I just realized I skipped our, enti our entire row of snapdragons. We've got Potomac Orange. Monica and I, when we did our work day recently, just came through and deadheaded these, which we I've never really done. I've never cut them back during the middle of the season. Um, and they are producing more color. We've got Madame Butterfly White. We've got Madame Butterfly Bronze with white, which I prefer over the just Madame Butterfly Bronze because it's got a little bit more of a lightness to it. Like the base of the bloom here has white while the other one doesn't, but you still get that fluffy apricot colored bloom. We've got Madame Butterfly Red. That's a prolific one. Look at that. This one's uh, Early Lemon Yellow. Isn't that pretty? two-tone yellow and then we've got a lavender right here uh, we've got another white this is just more of a, a clean bloom it doesn't have the fluff like the madame butterfly series this one is the legend light pink it's almost got in this lighting has kind of like a silver edge to it and then i think this one's the bridal pink right here a little bit more saturated and then there's apple blossom which is one of my faves i love love that because it's like a creamy white and then you just have a little bit of pink there Oh, there's one thrip. None in that bloom. Oh, two. But you know, before I'd open up a bloom and there'd be like 15 of them rolling around in there and like every single bloom that I opened. So this is a marked improvement. Okay, in this row we have the Crespedia, which I grow this every single year. And it's an amazing, <laughs> amazingly unique flower. Um, the cool thing about these, let me find an aged bloom. If you uh, dry the blooms, they stay pretty, I mean, nicely colored. If you harvest them earlier, of course, they will stay nicer. So I should get out here and get some of these real fresh, bright blooms harvested and get those drying because this is a really great one to work into arrangements uh, that you want to have last. Okay, for our straw flowers, we've got apricot. There's a purple, red, and a white. And let me show you, look at the color on these. They are so beautiful. And you'll see when they're brand new, they look kind of like this. Really pretty, very like tight bud. And then it starts opening up. I like them at this stage right here quite a lot. And then they open up more to this right here with a fresher yellow center. There's a little brown toward the edges of that yellow. And then they get even further down the road here, more brown. And then they start to poof out seeds. See this? Jeez. It's amazing how many seeds one flower will produce. It's just insane. But anyway, so for the straw flowers, you really do want to harvest the blooms at the stage you like them to be at because that's what they will stay at. That's what they will dry at forever. Um, and these are, you know, not ideal because they, you know, if they're starting to throw seeds, they will kind of fall apart in arrangements. Beautiful color though. And here's the purple red uh, right here. That's the stage I like this one at. And then you can see like what they do. You can see all of this. This wants to fluff apart. This is pretty too. And there's a little bit of yellow. They have that papery sound. And then we've got the white right here, which this stage, absolutely gorgeous. Ooh, or this stage right here. Oh, that's pretty. And then they get the yellow. So it looks like an egg, like a fried egg. And then brown. And then falling apart. <laughs> all right, guys, then we've got Gomfrina, which is also an amazing dried flower. In fact, I put all of these in the same row. So we've got Gomfrina, straw flowers, Crispedia, because they all like it on the dry side. So it's able to manage the water. I can turn the valves off and not give this water while I'm giving water to other things that need more of it. But we've got the orange Gomfrina right here, which I think is so beautiful. Look what they do when they get a little older. They kind of form up these long blooms right there but I just love it. I think this color is so pretty. We've got the white right here. I think this is Audrey white. And then we've got a light pink right here. And then a deeper pink. Oh, and there's a bumble. Is it sleeping? I think it might be sleeping. Hey, little dude. They hang off of flowers like this and sleep. That's why I don't want to, I don't want to spray anything. Okay, and then this row is a little bit hard to navigate, so I'm gonna probably just walk on the other side, but we do have uh, several varieties of Dianthus. There's the sweet white right here. 
which they are so easy to grow. The sweet white, the sweet white bicolor with purple over here, uh, super easy to start from seed. They're some of my robu most robust looking seedlings and the blooms do last a long time in a vase and they kind of have like a hydrangea vibe to them <laughs> and they don't wilt like hydrangeas do. Um, so if you kind of want that ball shape, they do bring that. There's the sweet purple, white by color, per sweet purple with white dianthus. And then we've got the Chabot series of dianthus, which they're very pretty. I mean, they've got real pretty color blooms here, like a light pink. This one's cool though. This one is the orange sherbet. Look at that. But see what happens when you're not cutting off of them or deadheading them. The spent blooms are pretty ugly. I thought the flowers were going to be a tiny bit bigger than this, but they're a very nice filler flower. These did have a fairly heavy infestation of thrips too, but I'm not, I'm not seeing any in them right now. Okay. I see the tag in here. This is the Shungiku, Shungiku edible chrysanthemum. Edible chrysanthemum right here. Really tall plant here. Really interesting bloom and edible. Apparently I have not tried them too early in the morning to try them. <laughs> okay, then in this row here, we've got a bunch of pincushion flowers. There was Bells of Ireland right here, which you can still see. Once you plant Bells of Ireland, you will have it for life. They're a little bit difficult to work into arrangements for me. I don't enjoy working with them that much, but we've got the Black Knight pincushion flower. Um, there's a pink right here, real pretty. Those are annuals. And then we've got the Fama Blue, which is a perennial this huge flowers super long stems and they're strong but they still have a little bit of um give to them which i love i love that they have a little flex easy to work into arrangements and i love the blooms on the pincushion flowers when they're done if you get after them a little bit earlier like see they will start to fall apart too right there their seeds look like little birdies like badminton birdies but their seed heads are so pretty to use in arrangements. And then there's Fama White, another perennial. So technically this one and the Fama Blue could be moved to the perennial section, but I'll probably just leave them here because I'll always do pincushion flowers here. I didn't realize those were perennial when I planted them. And then we've got the Merlot Red right here. And then we have a crop, it looks like a white finch orlea coming up. Little seedlings here, our Lysianthus. <laughs> it's kind of laying over at this point. Um, but we've got a light green. There's the white, the brown. And the pink. This is the only flower crop I'm considering staking. <laughs> I don't stake anything else. You can see I don't have any of that vertical. I don't really like the look of it. All that, you know, um, horizontal netting, Horta Nova, right? So I don't do the um, snapdragons. I don't, I don't stake anything other than the dahlias out here and sweet peas. But the section of Lysianthus, I mean, yeah, could lose, use a little bit of help. I still cut on them and I actually like that when the stems lay over and the snapdragons do this too, they still grow nicely and then they curve up. So I can use this in a vase, you know, putting the stem in the vase and then this part will kind of um, flop over the side of the vase, which is fun. It gives the, the uh, bouquet more of an interesting structure. These are the Arena Red, Voyage 2 Green, Mariacha, Mariacha, Pure White, Roseanne Brown, and Voyage 2 Pink. And then the last section in here, I have some more pincushion flower, which this one's just called, I think, Star Flower or something and you use it for the seed heads. The seed heads are just like, look at this. That is one seed right there. It is so interesting, so much detail. And the seed heads are just beautiful. And then we've got some Peach Screamer uh, Nicotiana, which I planted two years ago, and it just seeds itself a little bit. Look at really pretty peach color blooms. Nicotiana are such sticky flowers though. I don't like working with them all that much like touching them. Okay. And then we've got the rose garden here, which I'm not going to go through each one of them. Uh, I don't have them all tagged yet. I started in and then ran out of tags and I just showed this recently, but overall the roses are doing fantastic. I mean, the growth on these is crazy. And some of these were like two little stems when I planted them. So just to kind of take a little bit of a walk around here. 
like, oh, look at this. Look at the color. This is the Lady of Shalott right here. Oh, Molin Molino. So earlier blooms, more yellow, and then they age out with this gorgeous apricot tinge to them. Oh, Tchaikovsky. This is the Charles Darwin. This is Bolero, and there's a bee just chilling. Just chilling in there. Hot cocoa. Oh, this one is my best friend. Oh, I love this one is Edith's, Edith's, uh, Edith, Edith's Darling. When you add that apostrophe S, I have a hard time saying the word. Edith's Darling Rose. Look at how beautiful that is. I love how dainty the flowers are. I love that they come up in these kind of big clusters because what I would do in an arrangement is I would take the stem down like right in here and I'd use that whole entire top piece to kind of be my bouquet structure. And you could use it as a frog. Uh, you know, and work in other stems around all of those branches. Golden Celebration. Fun in the Sun takes on multiple different colors. When it first comes out, they're a little bit more yellow, and then they kind of age to this pink color. Oh, what is this one? Apricots and Cream. Oh my beautiful, that's so gorgeous. James Galway. Look at this, like full size right here. Is this the uh, Sweet Mademoiselle? Yep. Look at all these beautiful blooms and buds everywhere. So you get the idea of the rose garden and I just love how it's growing and filling in. And I know a lot of rose gar gardens are laid out a lot more ornamentally, but I wanted this one, one to kind of have the same feel of the other quadrants out here. I wanted there to be rose. Um, I also like that they're all spaced out quite far from one another so that you can easily access each one of the roses. I think that's really important if we're gonna wanna use them for cutting. And it's important for the health of the rose plant too. You want plenty of light and airflow to be able to hit each one of the plants, you know, all sides of the plants. And I think we're gonna get that. Okay, let's head to the dahlias. There are so many beautiful dahlias in here right now. Uh, first, we started with two rose zinnias, and there's a whole bunch of different varieties. Cupcake pink right here. There's Peruviana, which is kind of a little bit wild and mangy, and it looks iron deficient this year. It did not do that last year. See the yellowing on the leaves, but the veins are still dark? Hmm, I have been using them in arrangements though because they usually come up multiple blooms for a stem, and they're a little bit smaller, and I love the color. Now that pumpkin orange. This is the Mazurkia? It's botanical interest seed. They've got really interesting gradient of color. There's the Redmond Super Cactus, which ended up being one of my favorite varieties that I grew last year, which is wild because I usually don't like, you know, that red orange. It's very, very warm, very hot colored, uh, huge blooms. They're just so interesting to me. This variety came up in my Zinderella peach. So I don't know what it is exactly, but I love it. It's really pretty. There's the Zinderella peach. And they've got the really interesting kind of downturn blooms. Not all of them do, but most of them do. We've got the Oklahoma salmon, which are a little bit more of a dainty, more ball-shaped zinnia. And then we have the pink senorita, or senorita pink, I can't remember. Uh, but oh, these are so pretty. Such big, beautiful flowers with the perfect pink color, that warm pink. And then there's Oklahoma ivory right there, the smaller white sort of bloom. And these are the creamy yellow giant dahlia zinnias so some of them get some great big flowers but they're that really pretty soft yellow there's a honeyberry with a clary sage that came up by itself in there there's our rhubarb this is the crimson cherry variety this one is doing particularly well maybe because it's on the edge but we've got three in here that i planted last year and then oh my word so i don't have all of these labeled there's just a bunch of beautiful color and this patch is really coming into its own. It took a little while, and I think that's just kind of due to our experimentation. I started some of them by tubers, some of them I had grown on in the greenhouse, and some were wintered over from last year. But yeah, I'm really enjoying all the color out here. Oh, look at those. Are so gorgeous. I think I can walk down most of these rows, but I just want to walk down them quick and I'll uh, point out some of my favorite varieties, of which I may or may not know the name of. Like this one right here, we've got kind of the Cafe Alle vibe, but there's some with a little bit more pink, like this one here. I think these are more of the Cafe Alle Royals. They're so, so gorgeous. I love that one right there. It's got a really interesting structure and really pretty color. These are a go-to shape for me. The ball dahlias are really easy to tuck into arrangements. Um, and they usually like, I will cut a really long stem and use one that's got two or th three blooms at the top. 
This is a really pretty apricot colored one. Lilac thyme. Oh, beautiful white, pure white. That is a beauty. And I've been loving these right here. What are these supposed to be? Lights out is that variety. Really pretty. This bloom is aged, definitely. But I love how it's got that bright yellow, but a lot of creamy white. This one's got a wild shaped bloom. This one is poo. Okay, this one right here has probably the weakest stems. I think it's called Gouda Shank. Gouda Shank, maybe. Um, yeah, very thin, kind of weak stems, but I love to work these into arrangements. I don't know what it is about them, but they've got an orange, yellow, but they've got a pink note to some of them. And I just think they're beautiful. As are these right here, look at this. Perfection right there. This one has a glow quality to it with that kind of yellowish apricot toward the base of the petals. Oh, so, so beautiful. Gorgeous apricot color. And I love this. Is this what, like water lily type? Probably one of my favorites because they're not massive. There's a little spider on that one. Um, they're not massive. Like the dinner plates are beautiful and impressive, but they aren't very fun to work with in, in arrangements because they're so demanding of attention and they're kind of rigid. You know, you get a stem, there's no like flex. That, that bloom is gonna point that direction no matter what you wanna do with it. And if you try too hard to manipulate it, it'll pop off. These just have a little bit more workability, easier, easier to work with and they tuck in better. Melody Dora, I think. A shorter growing one. This is pretty, the pink with the yellow interior. I started with mostly tubers in this first row and look how much smaller. Like everything in this row is smaller. Ooh, I like this. I like that one a lot. This one is Bloomquist Tory P. Beautiful. Linda's baby. Oh, these are the Wizard of Oz right here. Doris Duke. And these are Sandia Panama. And then we have Peaches and Cream, which I don't have any really fresh blooms because I just cut them. But you can kind of see, let me shade it. You can kind of see how the interior is a darker apricot and the outside is a very creamy. But some of them bloom way more apricot. <laughs> Look at that. I've been enjoying the variation that that plant has been giving. This one is Rip City, and then we've got a red and white. Anyway, we've been overall enjoying the Dahlia Patch a lot. I mean, things are just really starting to cook out here. Um, plants are putting on a lot of growth. I mean, this, the heat certainly helps. And same thing goes for the thrips here in the Dahlia, same as the Snapdragons. I'm noticing fewer and fewer. They are still here, but you know, it's just gonna take some time. All right, this is our last area to look at, and this is the one that I want to turn into mostly perennials. Um, you can see that the first two rows, let's see, well, the whole first row is zinnias. I wanted those uh, rows, and I probably will keep both of those annual rows so I can align this walkway up to the flower shed with something that's similar. Uh, we did have two little black iron urns on either side of the door. They didn't have anything in them, haven't all season. So we moved them out a couple of days ago and I actually missed seeing them there. I haven't really focused on planting up that area. You know, when you go into the season and you have very clear ideas of what you wanna get done and some things just kinda get pushed to the back of the list every single time. I just really haven't had any major inspiration of what I wanna do in front of there. So I just kind of want to wait until that strikes. Second row is Celosia first, and we've got the Crystal Beauty or Crystal Palace, an apricot color, and some of them are huge. Look at this, this is all one right here. And some of them are wonderful to work with. Celosia is a weird one for me, especially the ones that are shaped like this. Um, they are bulky, they can be bulky, but these little ones are great. This one is the Selway White. I prefer this structure, a little bit easier. They're not as, um, as large. We've got the chocolate flower right here and they do smell like chocolate. More than the bloom though, I love the spent blooms. It looks like a second flower. Isn't that pretty? Beyond that, we have some perennial campanulas, which are not blooming and may not bloom until next year. And then we've got a section of delphiniums that just went for it. Just absolutely gorgeous and huge. They need some iron. This is what their leaves should look like right here. And this is what some of them are looking like. So we need to get after that. But it looks like aphid leavings right there, but I don't think that's what it is. There's no aphids on these plants. We've got a variety of foxglove right here. I think these are the cafe cream, which I do have a whole row of foxglove over here, but I planted that whole row up. So we've got that, those are second year bloomers. And then we've got more celosia here. This is the pink spike. 
We've got that kind of papery. These also dry beautifully. And then we've got Sunday Wine Red right here. And you know, I grow this one every year. I hardly ever cut it to use it. I don't know why. It's beautiful though. I love to see, to see it out here. And then we've got the Summer Pastels Yarrow, which is a really phenomenal uh, perennial. And I love the variation of color because we're getting whites, we're getting yellows, we're getting apricot, we're getting light pink, we're getting dark pink. And it's just this little section. And it's so, so prolific all summer long. And then we've got some perennial Rudbeckia right here. I can't remember the variety name, uh, but they've been beautiful. They look gorgeous, especially from the other side. Look at that. I wouldn't mind those in a flower bed. And then we've got our Eryngium or Sea Holly. These are an amazing dried flower. They get the blue stems. They are pokey, so you wanna kinda of be careful with that. And they do have a little bit of a scent. It's not the most pleasant scent, but it doesn't last for very long. It actually is something I didn't really realize about this plant, and I've grown it before. Um, but I cut some for an arrangement. I, in fact, I think I did a little thing on Instagram. It was mostly purples and blues. And then I put it in a vase on our kitchen table, and I was kinda of like, what is that? what does that smell? And I figured it out it was these, but it only lasted like a day. And then it just, I think it wore itself out and it was fine after that. So keep that in mind. I do want to get these probably harvested here soon so that we can get them hanging and drying because I'd like to use these for holiday arrangements. I also like the white glitter variety. So I'm gonna probably come in with some of that at some point. Okay, so we've got some Celosia. This is where it was planted last year and it just seeded itself. But I also have Echinacea purpurea, which we started from seed this winter. Look at it wonderful perennial flower and just like seeing this and realizing how easy it was to start from seed we could fill up a whole flower bed with that very easily and inexpensively echinacea purpurea is an easy seed to come by um this one needs iron this little section but all of these look great look at those oh they're so gorgeous okay this whole row here as you know is uh, strawberries and it will remain strawberries until one day we build ourselves some raised beds. So I really want to build some like waist high raised beds for strawberries because they're such a little plant and it, you have to be constantly bent over to check to see if there's strawberries ready or to harvest. It'd be so nice to be able to stand and do that, but I couldn't figure out where I wanted to have them and all that business. So we're just gonna let them be here. Uh, strawberry plants don't like produce really well for a super long time. So we'll let these run their course. I'm, we're cutting all of the babies, all the runners off just to keep them tidy and kind of in check here. It needs to be done, especially those June bearing ones up there. My goodness, they're just going for it. But we're getting some good production out here. This is a seascape variety. We've got two section of seascapes. There's a section of quinault and there's all stars and honey eyes. And then our foxglove row, boy, it was a stunner. I started these seeds this winter and there are like one, two, maybe four, five, six varieties in this row. A lot of white apricot and lavender, but Monica and I just came through and deadheaded all of them. Um, and they will bloom again next year, the same plant. And then they'll just have to reseed themselves in this area. I love the peach and the lavender here. And then we have one amaranth which we didn't have the heart to pull because it's so strong. It's not staked. It's just staying just like that on its own. We had amaranth planted right here last year. And then this is where we had our wheat, which we're already seeing some wheat pop up. I'm sure if we just turned the water on, it's, the water's off in this row, but if we turned it on, it would just grow another crop. Maybe we should just do that. <laughs> and then these two rows here are sweet peas, which they are looking really tired. We'll probably pull them out. Well, we'll see. They might start looking a little bit better. You see how the base, so they get kind of crunchy and dry looking, but they've been super productive. It takes them forever to get going, but it's worth it, worth the wait, because the scent out here is amazing and the color is amazing. And I love, love using these in arrangements. Oh, such pretty colors. And at the end of the sweet pea rose, I had a couple of tomatoes planted here last year. And so the, the frames were still here, but I also had some butterfly pea seedlings that I didn't have a trellis to, I didn't know where I was gonna plant them. So I thought, well, I'll just pop them right here. And they're doing great. I mean, they're not like super um, thick or anything, but like these have made it to the top and look at the flowers. I mean, last year we didn't get any of the butterfly peas to survive. So the fact that they're out here growing and that they have color, is awesome. Okay, the last spot I wanna look through is the orchard quick. I need to do some fruit thinning ASAP, especially on our nectarine tree. So we've got nine trees out here. Apricot, which was wonderful. It's a perfection apricot. Wonderful fruit. We have a honeycrisp apple. 
which most of the apples are wormy. We're gonna probably just pull these off. Um, some of them are clean, but not many. Apples are just tough to keep worms out of. I hate to be out here spraying, um, but I did spray the apple trees one time and I think I needed to do it. I think it's every two weeks um, for like, maybe till the end of July. <laughs> So anyway, they definitely didn't get enough spray. This tree is worse than the, the Fuji. Fuji looks a lot better. Uh, so I think what we'll do is pull off all the apples that have any damage just so that the tree doesn't have to support the growth of those and then try to be better at it next year. Ah, the nectarine tree. I have already thinned this twice. When the fruit is so little, it doesn't seem like they're that thick, but look at this poor branch. Oh, it needs the weight lifted off of it so bad. Uh, this one too. Look at this. It's just crazy. So we'll probably get after that today or tomorrow and get those the fruit thinned off. We'll just, you know, take off a ton of this weight. And that way the tree will produce bigger fruit too. I mean, it's a shame, but it has to be done. Grass is looking amazing in here. Aaron does mow it every week. He puts it at a higher setting than the grass pathways and it's definitely thicker, uh, but I don't know, I've been really enjoying it. We've got the Santa Rosa plum right here. These are a little bit smaller than the year before last. Last year we didn't get much off the tree, but I pruned it hard this winter, like really hard. And we had a ton of plums, but they are the sweetest, most juicy plums ever. Mmm, so good. Got our baby nectarine tree right back here. A few nectarines on it. This is our Alberta peach. Things are looking good. Tons of fruit. I need to come in and thin this one as well. My goodness, they're just wanting to be so productive. The Tilton apricot, which wonderful flavor. This tree produced fruit after the perfection. So we had kind of a good staggered harvest. The Tilton apricots were much smaller than the perfections. I don't remember them being smaller the first year we had them, but really wonderful flavor. And this is the Snow Beauty white peach. <laughs> goodness. Oh, this poor orchard, I need to get out here. Oh, I just like feel for it so much carrying that much weight. We're gonna have a great crop though. And then this is our Fuji tree. So the apples on this one are much smaller than the Honeycrisp, but more of them are clean um, and not buggy than on the Honeycrisp and so pretty. And then on our fence right here, I did plant a climbing rose last year. thought it was dead this spring. It was just like two brown sticks and it took forever for it to come out of it, but it did and it's doing great. And then we've got a Sensation Honeysuckle right here. Mm, smells so good. And you guys, that is where the cut flower garden currently stands. Things are doing really well. Super, super happy with how everything's looking. We've got some spots to plant some things. Huge shout out to Paul and Bethany. They keep this area looking really good, like weed free. I mean, I didn't see weeds when we were walking through. Uh, they've got it kind of on a rotation, so they kind of keep up on that really well. Couldn't do it without them. So anyway, just happy with how things are right now toward the end, latter part of August. We still have probably, well, we've got all of September and a good portion of October before things will start kind of petering out out here. Uh, so a couple more good months, we'll get out of this space. Anyway, that is it for today's video. It was nice being out here early this morning, um, kind of beating the heat and things look so fresh and, and nice in the morning time. So I hope you guys are having a great day and we will see you in the next video. Bye.